I like my coffee black. Delina just blew my mind. Who is Delina and what are we talking about today? So we had on today uh, Delina Ivanova, who is an associate director for data and insights at HelloFresh Canada. Uh, there she leads a full service data team that includes data engineering, data science and business intelligence and automation. And she's an incredibly pers- incredibly impressive person with a long track record of individual contributor work, but also technical management work, which we talked a lot about, Demetrios. Isn't that right? So, yeah, I think my favorite thing here was her talking about the differences and the advantages that you look at when you're put into a managerial position for a data team. The things that she needs to basically block for for her team to make sure that her team does what it wants to do. So she said, and then what she has to think about in return, right? Like, so she's focusing on how, okay, if this is going to scale later on, what does that look like? Also talking to the different business stakeholders and explaining what they're choosing, why they chose something, what the whole uh, rationale behind their choices are. And then allowing her team to do the fun stuff, which is hands on the keyboard and building the actual uh, product or, or maintaining it. Yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed that part of the conversation. I'd say I have two really key takeaways that I, I would encourage everybody to watch out for. Number one, I really enjoyed hearing about how complicated HelloFresh's business model is. You know, it's easy for us, at least in the U.S., to just see it as a meal prep company or a meal, meal kit company. But uh, Delina's positioning of it as a food solution company, I thought was much more interesting and shows, you know, how complex the entire company is and how data has to flow through to make them a valuable company, which they are. And then second, I thought that her her thoughtful reflections on management were really helpful for me to understand like what goes through the mind of a good manager. Uh, it helps me as a current individual contributor understand like what kinds of things my manager thinks about and how I can help them understand those things, especially her point about the fact that her team will always be more, uh, have more expertise in the problems yeah. that they're solving than her. I thought it was a really humble way to think about management. And, and, you know, I think those kinds of insights are worth gold. And so I really enjoyed having her on. And we don't know this because neither of us have worked with her, but I get the feeling that she would be awesome to work for. Absolutely. I mean, like, absolutely. yeah, you just, I mean, talking to her and how she speaks about a, her team and B what, she thinks about and how she thinks through things, problems and challenges, whatever she comes into contact with. It's like, oh, wow. Like if every manager that I ever had to work for was like that, I think it would make work a much different (laughs) field of play. Like it wouldn't be as much of a burden as it has been in the past when I've worked for crappy managers. And I'm sure you've had some pretty bad ones too. I think that's just kind of a rite of passage. And so when you do get a manager like her, it's, yeah, it's incredible and they really shine. So everybody, if you do work for her, please reach out and let us know if she is as awesome as we think she is. And that is it. The last thing that I'll say before we jump into the full conversation, we're looking for people to help us organize local meetups. So if you would like to have a local MLOps meetup in your city in real life. We've got them started in Berlin. We've got them started in Amsterdam, Barcelona, Lisbon. There's some in New York, San Francisco. We're really looking for people in Austin, Texas, because I hear that's a cool place to go, and I'm going to use it as an excuse to go there. And Denver, Colorado, and Seattle, Washington. So if you are in any of these places, reach out to us, and you want to organize some stuff and get some cool talks going, let us know. Without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Delina. First and foremost, I would love to start with career trajectories and career growth. I know it's one of your favorite topics, Delina, so (laughs) we can start, start there. And maybe it would be good just to hear a little bit about your own trajectory and how you have progressed through the... Uh, corporate schema. 
Yeah, for sure. And I, I think it's a little bit different for different people. But um, one thing that I love about data, w the data world and everything to do with machine learning and data science is that it's actually quite accessible as a field. And I love that many people with different backgrounds can not only learn the skills that they need, but they have access to roles that can help them get into this field. Um, and in fact, what I often tell people is not to discount any of the previous experience they have because it usually becomes quite valuable when you are a data scientist or you're working with machine learning or you're even leading a data team like I am now. So for myself, I didn't start out in specifically a data science role, but I started working in finance. So very, again, data heavy, like data heavy roles, analytical roles, but specifically um, in finance financial modeling forecasts and did some product analytics. And then I actually did some consulting where I looked at operations and strategy. Um, and I would say that those types of roles really taught me a lot about being uh, solving problems and just thinking objectively about problems, um, ha learning how a business operates, how a business makes decisions. And I think these are critical skills and knowledge areas that anyone should have to be an effective data person and, and be effective at finding data solutions for business problems. Um, and then I started when data science sort of became more of a focus. Uh, I was working at the bank at the time and we had just stood up like an analytics function, like a central analytics function. Um, and so I started working there and I started exploring initially some questions around data ethics. So some of the first uh, role, some of the first roles that I did were really around um, data policy, data governance, but then also data ethics. Like how do we use data for good? What should we be using versus not using? And how do we find kind of creative ways to um, use data that's not going to create any sort of um, discriminatory outputs or, you know, give it the wrong, biasing on the wrong things, so to say, um, which I think sort of set me up to, again, be able th to think about data problems holistically. So both from a problem solving perspective, but also from a data perspective of what should we be doing with this? Shouldn't we be doing with this? Um, and then that led me to eventually to this role here. Uh, where I'm now at HelloFresh, and now I lead sort of a full data team. But I think all of these different experiences um, have made me more effective in this role um, from the perspective of being able to recognize business problems, uh, identifying the right solution. We often hear that, you know, a prescriptive machine learning model isn't always <laughs> the best solution. Sometimes you just need, you know, a simple report. So I think those kind of experiences for me combined um, have helped me be effective here. Uh, and then from a skill set perspective, again, the thing I love about um, data roles is that all of the knowledge is out there and it's available for you. Like you can learn Python, you can learn statistics, you can learn uh, machine learning, you can learn how models work, you can learn math. And that's it's definitely one of the most accessible fields from an information and resource availability perspective. Um, and so for me, I just spent a lot of time kind of learning how to code and learning how infrastructure works and learning how, where to get data and how to get data and, and kind of went from there. So um, that's kind of my thought on my own career. But I think for people who are thinking about career development, um, the field is very large, obviously. And, and you know, you it's hard to be a specialist in all the different areas that participate in the world of data. Completely. Yeah, but it's there's something for everybody. So no matter what you're sort of interested in, I think the number one thing I would always say is never to discount like your prior experiences because those will help you be better um, if you are sort of switching careers. But if you're young and you're kind of just deciding what you're doing now, then like try different things, right? And see what you like. And sometimes you like modeling a bit more than programming. Sometimes you really like building software and maybe machine learning ops is more for you, right? Or data engineering versus the pure sort of data science. But there's something for everybody, which I think is makes this field really great. I love that you had a little stint in the land of ethics because yeah. I feel like that is something that we don't see that much or even mention that much. And mm -hmm. this may be me being totally biased, but I feel like when we talk to people about certain challenges that they're having in the workplace, you rarely hear the question being asked, should we do this? It's yeah. a lot of, can we do this? Mm -hmm. And if it's feasible, if it's possible, then we're going to do it. But we never take a step back and say, should we do this? And yeah. how are we looking at the the data that's being collected, is it being collected in in quote unquote ethical way, right? Yeah. So I, I really uh, appreciate that. And just a bit of a tangent too that I wanted to go down with you before we go like into specific ways that you've seen different paths 
uh, mm -hmm. and people take the different uh, IC path or the managerial path, I wanted to take this tangent and look at the idea of telling stories with data. And mm -hmm. it, it kind of came up when you were talking about it. What in your mind has helped you become better at telling stories with data? Uh, to be honest, I, I would say that a lot of um, my consulting experience has actually made me a better mm -hmm. communicator overall. So uh, when I was working in consulting, there is a book called The Pyramid Principle, and it's, it's sort of the consulting Bible for anyone that's worked at McKinsey at some point will probably have been forced to read this. Uh, but it was recommended to me at the time that I worked there, and it was really about how kind of sort of structuring your thought process, but also structuring your communication in anything from emails to presentations to analysis that you've done. And so I've kind of taken that and I, I apply it now every day. So anytime that we build some sort of data solution, I think, you know, um, understanding what your, who your audience is and who you're talking to. And for the most part, we're not really talking to people that are going to understand our technical jargon or infrastructure that we're referencing or what Databricks means or an S3 bucket or something like that. And so these are not useful terms for us to use. And so when we're explaining kind of the solutions and thinking about our objective of data storytelling, our objectives are typically that um, we want to share our approach and our uh, mechanism of arriving at some sort of conclusion with somebody, because often there's many different ways to look at the same problem. So we want people to be aligned with the process that we took to arrive to that conclusion. And so we need to walk them in a way that they'll understand with what was the problem that we're solving for. You know, here's what I thought about when I collected the data that I selected. Here's sort of the models that I tried and the different approaches I tried and this one worked best. Here's why it worked best. And then based on this, here's my recommendation. Um, and then sort of from an infrastructure perspective, we're, if we're getting into building data products and in software, the second thing we always want to do with storytelling is garner empathy from stakeholders on why it's taking us so long to answer a question and why it's not as simple as running a SQL query and pulling three data points and giving them an answer, right? Because these are complex things. These are complex uh, questions that we're trying to answer. And so being able to sort of um, explain in a simple way what we're looking to build, why our solution that we're proposing is a better solution um, than a simple sort of query or something that's more scalable. And especially with MLOps and, you know, putting things into production and, and again, just building software all together with data products is one sort of some, some summation word for all of that. Um, but these things take a lot of time. And so I think storytelling is really about communicating your objective of what you, the approach that you've decided to go with and why, and why that's the best approach. And to um, if it's going to take you some time to build something that's scalable and sustainable and can be used in an ongoing basis, being able to articulate why that is to people who don't really have an innate understanding of the infrastructure and the, the processes you follow. Um, but yeah, the pyramid principle, I think, was great for me. And, and now I try to kind of teach my teams as well to use that same approach of like starting at the top, like key messages, <laughs> break it down into further information and then break it down into the details if people are interested. And have you found any other tricks for being the translator when it comes from taking information from the business side and bringing mm -hmm. it to your data teams? Yeah, I mean, I think for data teams, it's equally as important to understand the business. And oftentimes data teams are so caught up in their own kind of world of working with data and working with solutions that they don't have um, a lot of time to spend understanding what's going on. Uh, so uh, an example of where I use this in my day to day is we have data warehouses that uh, hold a whole bunch of data, obviously, about our customers and our business, which we use for a lot of our models. But that data gets generated somewhere and, and typically it gets generated on our website or on an internal tool that we're using. So what I like to do with new hires is I always walk them through where data comes from and where it's generated and then how that gets fed into the data warehouse. And the reason I do that is because I find it gives them an understanding of that customer journey to say, OK, when I'm looking at a customer, this is what the person is doing on the website. This is how they're making a decision or an internal person. This is the tool they're using. Um, and when I do it that way, I found it's helpful to then articulate the problem we're trying to solve. So if this is, you know, the customer experience and the customer, let's say, is looking at recipes and they have 100 recipes facing them, they don't know which one to choose. This is why we need to solve the problem of a recommendation engine, for example, because we should be able to give them their kind of top five that we think they'll like. 
Um, so showing that like data origination piece, I think helps humanize the process and then data people can empathize with what the user is going through. And that helps them become better problem solvers because they're putting that user experience lens on. I really like that point around helping your team understand what data means. Yeah. I think that as much as business teams need to understand, you know, how data empowers them, mm -hmm. uh, the data team itself also needs to understand, you know, what, how, what they're doing, you know, is represented in, in, in the context of the business and the data. And yeah. it's a very bi-directional flow that has to happen. Yeah. I want to pivot this sort of discussion slightly and talk a little bit about technical management, mm -hmm. engineering management, and, yeah. and how you got into that and how you like it. Mm -hmm. um, can you start off maybe by telling me a little bit about like what your day-to-day -day role looks like as a yeah. associate director at HelloFresh and what your distribution of time looks like? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have on my team specifically, we've got an engineering team, a BI and automation team, and a data science team. And so we have a good mix of sort of business analysis type folks, as well as very technical folks uh, that are building solutions. Um, I would say that my my day to day personally, I spend quite a bit of time with stakeholders to understand the challenges that they're facing. So my team supports all of the different business departments in uh, HelloFresh Canada. So everything from marketing to product to ops procurement. And so it's a really wide portfolio and it requires that sort of broad understanding of what the business is doing. Um, so I think for me uh, personally, my day-to-day uh, -day is kind of understanding what people are dealing with, where we can step in and making an assessment of where it's appropriate for us to step in versus having a stakeholder do something themselves or maybe manage their own solution um, and, and try to kind of assign value value to all of the projects we do. And, and value is hard to measure, right? Because you're investing a lot of time in building, um, again, either a software or a model and deploying that somewhere and maintaining that uh, and building it into processes. You're spending a lot of time doing that. So there has to be some sort of value. Um, and so from a business perspective, I'm always thinking about uh, revenue generation versus cost reduction. Cost reduction is always easier to measure value on because you typically know how much something costs and now you're trying to sort of reduce that. But with revenue generation, it's hard because we, we can never fully attribute any sort of revenue to any sort of data solution. Like the data solutions will certainly help, but we, we don't know exactly how much revenue can be attributed there. Um, and so most of the time, my strategy, at least when I initially started building this team, was to kind of build trust in data among stakeholders. So delivering value very quickly for a period of time so that they can see that there's value in letting data teams take the time to build something more complex. I think as a leader of a data team and as a manager, your job is to buy your team time. And the way you buy time is by prioritizing some quick to value solutions first so that your team has time to work on those more complex things that you know will add value, but may not be so apparent to the business stakeholders immediately. Um, in terms of my team, so day to day for them, they're you know uh, in in the weeds of building a lot of our solutions. So whether that's models, whether that's um, you know even software. Again, so we build a number of different softwares to enable access to data or to provide really data products that we're building. So they're really in the weeds of that. Uh, pipelines, managing our databases, our data storage. Um, so they're really in the, weed, in the weeds of all of that. And I think um, the one interesting thing, at least that I found as sort of becoming a manager of a technical team is that your team will always know more than you. So there's always that sort of, um, it, it, you kind, like what's your role on the team as a manager is to buy them time so they can focus and to continue to build trust in data amongst your stakeholders and to find the right opportunities and prioritize where they should be adding time. But that the sort of trade off there is that you don't have that much time yourself to keep up with the technology and to keep up with what everybody is doing all the time. And so I think when people are thinking about that sort of management versus individual contributor path, um, it, you know, it really depends on your personal interests. And if you are somebody that wants to be really involved in the, in the tools and building solutions and actively building solutions and, and all of that stuff, then you should be an individual contributor. And as soon as you become a manager, you're now spread a little bit thinner. You're, you know, opining on a lot more things. You're, you become more of a translator and identifying requirements, determining what the team is doing, um, helping them think through the flow, uh, thinking about scalability. So if we build a solution now, how is that going to change in two months, three months, eight months with the business strategy? So if the business grows, am I going to need to be ready to add something to this solution or change the way that it works? Um, whereas your team on the ground isn't going to be thinking about that because they're just thinking about 
getting the one sort of thing done. So I, I think that's sort of how the roles change. Um, but it's it's an interesting experience. And, you know, I often find myself feeling that pressure of like, how do I keep up? And I need to know all the things. And my team members will find new things that they're using all the time. And sometimes I'm like, I have no idea what this is. And But it's fun. I get to learn all the time. And I learn from them. And, you know, at the same time, learning to let go a little bit and <laughs> not control everything. Yeah, I, you know, I think, there's so much great that you, great stuff that you said there. In particular, that point around how your team will always know more than you, yeah. right? And how you have to, you know, elevate the way that you work to a different level um, yeah. in order to, you know, really take advantage of their talents best and their yeah. time in the best possible way. Was it difficult for you to give up day-to-day -day individual contributing work and, and sort of coding? Yeah, I mean, at first, yeah, because you, you're you used to controlling how something works and you have your own way of, of doing things and other people are going to have their, their own way of doing things or their own thoughts. Um, I think at first it's, it's hard to not have that control because you're used to sort of controlling. Um, but I think it's important to, um, as, a, as a manager and as a leader, you have to sort of figure out what is your role within your team. So you have a team of 15, 20 people, let's say, and they all work together and everybody has a role. And your role isn't to, uh, at least in my view, your role isn't to be managing people to a T and telling them exactly how to spend their time or exactly what to do. Your role is to be training them, teaching them best practices, but that's what those are, their best practices. You're not kind of like controlling every single element. So I think for me, initially, it's it's always hard for everybody to give up that because you're ultimately accountable for anything that your team does. So you obviously need to have some oversight and understanding of what they're doing. Um, but then also your role changes. And so for me, it was about kind of recognizing that in my new role, the value I add to my team isn't duplicating their work or, you know, working with them on something or telling them how to do something. The value I add is helping them navigate the complexity of the company that we work in, helping them navigate and build a solution that's going to be useful, and then helping them sort of prioritize what to build first and how to think about the long term. That said, though, um, we are, my team at least, like I'm still pretty hands on and I do work on my own projects as well. So sometimes if it's something where, um, you know, I think, especially if I'm just scoping something out, like I'll usually do that myself before I give it to anybody on the team because I don't know yet if I, and again, that, that role of, identifying if something is valuable or not. Sometimes I don't know yet if something is doable or if it's valuable. So I might build like a quick prototype myself just to kind of see if it's something worth pursuing. And then once I'm confident, I'll give it to someone on the team that can do it 10 times better than me. And then they'll they'll sort of take care of it from there. So I think you, there is always still time for you to do what you enjoy and for myself to do what I enjoy. But um, it, that time becomes less. So am I going to be building you know, complex software that is truly scalable and in production and stuff like that? Probably not, but I can still do a bit of that upfront work and work with the team to get to, to those end goals. I think that what you really point out with your responses is that the context in which you work is as important as what you work on. Yeah. And I think in many ways that represents the, the, the trade-off between you know, management and contribution, which is really something everybody does, you know, even yeah. if you're a, you know, a junior IC on a 50 person team, you're still managing up, you're still working with people to help them understand what it is you're actually doing. Yeah. And you know, part of the reason I wanted to talk about this was because it's an active discussion, I think, uh, in our community, many times, you know, for many mm -hmm. members, like, do I go down the management track and maybe spend yeah. some time as an engineering manager? Mm -hmm. Or do I spend more time, you know, on my individual contributor piece and then kind of go down maybe the tech lead side or the senior mm -hmm. to staff? And, you know, I think we are actively in a moment right now in the engineering world where we're starting to think more about what does good leadership for technical work look like as the importance of technical work to business value has grown. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and yeah. it's it, and it is. I I think it's a topic amongst um, anybody that works in this space, even people that have been doing it for some time, because you know the types of things that I think about is um, you know motivating the team. And right now we have a huge talent gap in tech. Like people are, we know this to be true. People are always moving around. And if you think about what does it take for me to get value out of somebody, so do I really in, in traditional roles like outside of tech for a long time when I was working, like you probably spend you know two years in a job two 
two, three years in a job and that, you know, the first six months were sort of like onboarding and then you kind of add value for six months and then you maybe start thinking about your sort of next move. But the world is not like that now. So it, it sort of begs this question of as a technical leader, um, one, how do you get value from people very quickly? And you're not going to do that by being very um, like micromanaging, right? Because people want to work in a place where they have freedom and autonomy to build the solutions in the way that they want to build them. And they, in a bit, you know, with tech, it's a bit of a creative field as well, because there's many ways that we can solve the same problem. So giving them that autonomy is something that people probably value in this type of space. But then at the same time, you have to, as a leader, balance that autonomy and what people are building with the long-term vision, which is a little bit more difficult because as, especially in the case of, you know, HelloFresh, our business moves very quickly and things change very quickly. And so we build some, you know, solution model software, whatever today in six months, it's going to be different because we're going to have different products, different parts of our business. And so that needs to evolve. So how do we build something in th products in ways, in a way that they're going to be scalable. And so that if that person leaves in a year, somebody else can just sort of pick it up and run with it or continue to build on top of it. And I think, um, and then that's where we kind of get into this sort of uh, element of like governance, right? And, and really tech governance and data, data product management, tech product management, and the importance of not only defining um, requirements of what tech needs to look like, but also defining long-term roadmaps that are really attached to business strategy and designing tech in a way that's going to be scalable, documenting how things work, having a really common understanding. I mean, if you even think about anybody operating in an AWS environment, there's over 600 services in AWS, which means that any one developer can take a very different path to how they build a solution. And not everyone's going to understand all the services. So it's not as simple as just handing this over to a new person that starts on your team. So really taking that time to like, document and tell that story of like, here's what we built. Here's why we build it this way. Long-term considerations, if it grows, if it needs to scale, like here's suggestions on how you might navigate that. And, and it's almost like managing the turnover that we know is going to come so that we can get value from people in the time that they're with us. We can make sure they're working on something and, you know, hopefully they stay, but we can make sure they're working on something that is valuable for them and valuable for us. And then we're sort of building for that future to, for the longer term. I feel like I went on a sort of a different answer there, but so good though. <laughs> no, no, I think these are, these are honest reflections from your time as a manager and what you found successful, uh, about motivating a team, getting the most out of them, which is, which is really crucial. You know, I think there's a heavy emphasis on hiring the best talent uh, yeah. in the discourse, not the heaviest emphasis on getting the most out of the talent when it walks in the door, mm -hmm. which is a much harder problem. Yes. Right. Uh, and that is honestly, a, what's more realistic for a lot of companies, right? It's get the mm -hmm. most out of what you have, not sit there and pine for something better, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and so, yeah. And you, know, you end up just spending so much time and money if you do get mm. someone that maybe isn't a good fit or they're just such an incredible right. talent that they hop jobs mm -hmm. once every six months, like we were saying. Yeah. And Which you is a real are, thing. Yeah. yeah. And actually, when you were talking about that, it reminded me of the song that I wrote. It's not really a full-fledged song. It's just a few chords on the guitar. And it was, <laughs> I played it, it and I threw it on TikTok in case Vishnu, nice. you want to see it, you can duet with <laughs> uh, me. Vishnu, nobody yeah. knows this about Vishnu, but he is, uh, he was like a professional singer. So what? I'm waiting uh, for you to do, <laughs> yeah. Guys, uh, I'm, I'm waiting I'm for some to... duets, Vishnu. <laughs> I'm going to have to make a TikTok <laughs> account just for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Please but do. anyway, yeah, Please it's like, do. join, like, subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole thing of the song, like the lyrics are, this is the story of the ML engineer who changes <laughs> their job once or twice a year. Technical debt is building up. So yeah. they got to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I <love that. laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. And it's got some melody to it. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I like that. And I think um, <laughs> that really resonates with me because I think this is when people kind of look at career development too, you know, uh, a lot of people like to build things, me included. And, and I like to, you know, one of the things I love is like standing up a team and building up a team from scratch. And so I've uh, tripled the size of my team since I started here last year. And, and part of it is because I like taking sort of this blank space and starting from nothing and sort of building up something. But um, 
then, then there comes a point where now you have to like maintain the team and grow the complexity of what it's doing. And so there's sort of, I think when it comes at least to team growth and team management, you sort of start with building a team and then uh, managing the complexity as that team grows, managing the sort of um, norming stage of the team where the operations have to become a little bit more normal. But I think with, with software and any of the complex solutions that individuals build, that's kind of the same thing because a lot of people really like to build things. Not a lot of people like to maintain things and manage complexity. And so, but both are very like critical experiences to get. And so these people, the people that generally tend to jump around, they come into a company, they build up something really great. Then we get a lot of that technical debt for whatever reason. And then somebody else has to sort of come in and either clean it up. And a lot of times they don't want to clean it up. They just build something new because that's easier. And so you have all of these builders um, but yeah, and I think it's an important consideration for team management of how do you get people that are builders, but also people who have that in-depth understanding of the tech and can maintain and evolve something, like take something that uh, has existed for some time and make it better versus just building something new and putting you in the same position. Yeah, especially when they're not the ones that built it, like you said, yeah. that is a huge <laughs> point that people, yeah. I think, are a little bit less excited about fixing something that they didn't build and they have to go read the documentation totally. on or they have to go figure yeah. out like how <laughs> it was set up and why. And you spend mm -hmm. a lot of time and energy just trying to navigate the labyrinth. But yeah. I've got a kind of, I don't know if I would call it a controversial question, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this. How much do you feel growing your team actually grows your productivity? Oh, not much. I feel like I would rather have a smaller team that's highly productive than a bigger team that um, mm -hmm. is not as productive. And I think um, at least my view is I sort of think of it as a little SWAT team. And it's because if you're if a company is investing in a data team, any version of a data team, we know it's going to be expensive. We know it's a cost center. And so you really need that team to be delivering value. I think when you manage a team that has a lot of resources, they start to do a lot of low value work because uh, business partners will hand over sort of that low value work, right? Like reporting, running SQL queries, a bunch of stuff. So then you're going to have a whole bunch of people working on that when their talents are probably better used doing something else. But if you have a sort of smaller team that you can protect, you've proven the value that they add, you can protect their time, you can have them focus on high impact work. It works for both parties because then you can, you know, they're happy because they get to kind of kick out projects probably very quickly and they can do a whole bunch of different things. Um, and they get that sense of like importance and contribution as well. So they they know the value that they add to an organization. And at the same time, you mm. keep business partners at bay a little bit because they know that your team's time is valuable. And so if they're going to give you something, it better be something needy and it better be like a problem that you're solving. And so I, to me, that's sort of the approach and um, that I think works best. Obviously, the size of the team should be sort of in correspondence with whatever the size of the company is. But um, yeah, I'm all for small, mighty team <laughs> versus something bigger that uh, you kind of lose track of where people are spending their time and it may not be that valuable. Yeah, the reason I ask is because I just think about how a lot of times you're almost pressured to grow and it, yeah. it looks great on your resume if you manage 20 people or 40 mm -hmm. people or the yeah. more people that you managed, the better it looks, especially if you're a manager and you're taking that managerial yeah. path. And yeah. I think about how just in the community, like mm -hmm. not, I don't even manage really, but just the more people sometimes that come into the community and there's always a lot of people that are willing to help. And I love that. It's so cool to see. But sometimes there's that saying where it's like too many chefs in the kitchen spoil the oh, soup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it ends up being like, yeah, actually, like, I would love for you to help out. But you know what? Like, I don't know if having more people on this problem is going to solve the problem. Exactly. It's only going to make the problem more like of uh, organizational mess. Yeah, and I think on your first comment about um, managers striving for bigger teams, I think that's just the fundamentally wrong way in how we measure success. I, I think you know your your role as a manager is to um, again find the solutions that are most pressing for a business and to help your team prioritize them and give them guidance on how to build those solutions. And so your your performance should really be measured on effectiveness of what you've delivered and effectiveness in allocating the team's time to the most pressing needs. Um, but yeah, I totally hear you also. The, that's the other sort of challenge on the bigger team because 
you're going to have different personalities, different people that uh, solve problems very differently, people that have, you know, want to opine on different parts of a problem or have, you know, pissing on the hydrant is what I used to call it back in banking. Oh my like God, a lot that's of, so true. <laughs> yeah, like a lot of people want to piss on the hydrant and, uh, you know, and that's fine. Like people, everybody's going to have a, an opinion about something and, um, you know, it's almost like the work gets really diluted. So when you have sort of one meaty thing, a lot of people want to take part in it because they all want to have that as part of their own personal sort of accomplishments um, versus in an environment where you have lots of work and fewer people, <laughs> then you're probably not going to worry about that too much because there will always be enough for everybody and people will be more likely to focus on their own specific thing. But yeah, it's an interesting problem. <laughs> I think this is a great discussion. And I would love to add context here by talking more about what HelloFresh actually is, what your team, you know, sort of does yeah. in terms of uh, actual like sort of product development, etc. Mm -hmm. I know all of us, every single one of us, at least in the U.S., has gotten one of the little slips oh, good. that gives us <laughs> some X number of dollars off of 10, 10 meals. So oh, yeah. I know we're, you're a meal kit company, yeah. but could you give the listeners a little bit more of a sense of like how, like what HelloFresh actually is um, yeah. from a business standpoint? Absolutely. So I think we're, we're a meal solution company. So we're a food solution company. Um, I would say from a data perspective, this is definitely the most interesting business I have ever worked at. I think it's a v extremely interesting business model because it has all the, all the challenges that any business might have plus more. So uh, basically the way our business works is you can go on the app or on the website, you can select a bunch of uh, meals that you'd like to eat later in the week. Um, we send you boxes, pre-portioned ingredients for every single meal, and then you cook your meals at home. Uh, in the U.S., we also have a few other offerings. So we have ready-to-heat meals, for example. So if you don't want to cook, but you just want to heat up your meal, then it's pre-cooked for you. So we've got the Factor brand in the U.S., which does ready-to-heat. Um, and then a few smaller brands with uh, specific diets. So if you want, like, vegetarian only, we have something called Green Chef. Uh, I think that's in the U.S. We have Every Plate, which is more of a value version of our meal. So we've got a few different brands, but in the crux of it, our, our role is to create meal solutions and food solutions. Um, and it's it's interesting, right? Because we're so on the business model side, this is really interesting because we're not only competing with um, grocery stores, but we're actually competing with this habit that people have and the habit of going grocery shopping every week and then coming home and cooking meals and meal planning. So we're trying to take that away, that sort of activity of having to meal plan. Um, we know people are busy. If you, you know, t tend to order out, then our food is for you. So if you're spending a lot of money ordering Uber Eats or whatever you're doing, this is much better for you. You can make it yourself. It's cheaper. Um, and so it, it gives you that convenience factor without, uh, yeah, it just gives you that convenience factor without the sort of additional cost and all that stuff from, from Uber Eats. So I would say our, our right. target market is people that are looking for convenience. Um, but from yep. a business model perspective, why it's such an interesting data problem is because, so we've got the e-commerce, which is obviously people ordering and mm -hmm. then sending food to them. Uh, we also produce all of the boxes ourselves. So we have a huge um, kind of distribution facility where we package all of the boxes. We have a pick and pack operation. In Canada, we actually have a manufacturing operation as well, where we manufacture some of our own like sauces and things like that. Um, and then we have uh, sort of that production planning and then our own sort of logistics that we deliver boxes. We also have our own chefs and culinary teams that design our menus. We do all of our own like photography and user experience stuff ourselves as well. So from a data perspective, it's interesting because you have the complexity of being kind of a just-in-time operation where you want to have the right recipes displayed to the right people at the right time so that they can make their choices and have enough choice and you want to have sufficient choice for them so they don't feel like they're boxed into anything. And that's sort of on the revenue side. And then on the cost side, um, you want to have the right raw ingredients at the right time in your facility so that you can produce the number of boxes you need with at the same time minimizing waste and not creating any, any food waste, which is one of our missions on sustainability. We uh, exist because we want to eliminate food waste. Um, and then sort of delivering those boxes to people on time and keeping them cold, right? Because we're delivering perishable food items. So there's a big time element um, also with perishability because food goes bad. So we can't hold a lot of inventory, right? We can't, we don't have that availability, uh, ability like an Amazon to have a huge distribution warehouse with a lot of inventory. We have to operate in that just-in-time model. So it's really, really complex. Um, I think anyone who's like 
ever done um, operations analytics or optimization modeling. If you want to whip out your calculus textbook, it's a lot of that kind of stuff. So <laughs> it's a perfect, nice. perfect company for that. But yeah, it's super interesting. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like what I'm hearing there are challenges of e-commerce, CPG, yeah. logistics, uh, and grocery all combined into one yeah. in a highly competitive market mm -hmm. where margins are like really exactly. important yeah. to, to maintaining competitive position. Yeah, it's a volume game, absolutely. It's a market yeah. share and volume game. And, um, and it's an expansion game, right? So the, the business has to expand. Right. I think we're in 17 countries now, so we've expanded quite a wow. bit over the, and we've only been around for 10 years, so it's huge growth for uh, overall. Um, but then no the other, the other uh, sort of interesting thing, so in Europe, where our main office is, is in Berlin, and so most of our operations are in Berlin, but obviously we have Canada and the US, and our challenges are also very different because Canada and the US are very big countries. And so you can't get, when it comes to supply chain and you think about, you know, supply chain optimization, um, you know, we, we can't always get the same food from every supplier. Sometimes we're going an extra country or two down south to get food, but that's a really, really big distance. That's thousands and thousands of miles. Um, and then again, from a production perspective, if we sort of have spread out facilities, how do you optimize which facility builds which box for which customer and that, and how does that get delivered in the most optimal way so that you can limit the amount of time that food is aging before it even gets to the customer. So it's really, really complex and even more complex in North America. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's overwhelming just listening. Demetrius, I know you had something yeah, to say there. Yeah, it's interesting too. One thing that I think about with that is probably a lot of cultural differences between yeah, the sure. different uh, countries that you go into. And I think yeah. about how my own, so I live in Europe right now and my wife is Spanish and it is very uncommon for her especially to think about eating out more yeah. than once a week. And then yeah. you go to the US and especially in the tech fields that you, you have people who basically live off of Uber Eats and yeah. that's their like, that's okay, their diet. All right. uh, yeah. <laughs> Specifically, Mr. Vishnu. Citizen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, uh, I just think about that and how, how yeah. different it is in the way that people think about that. And then mm -hmm. you, you also add on all these other very minute differences that you wouldn't really think about, but you probably are hitting head on when you are conducting business in the different areas. So it's yeah. awesome. And it's probably a good transition to talking a little bit about data engineering because, yeah, so this is like, nice. <laughs> you like how I did that, eh? Um, but <laughs> You're a pro. I am. I try sometimes. Sometimes I get it right. Um, but yeah, so from a data engineering perspective, right, like we think about, so how do we, how do we learn about our customers and how do we meet all of these differences? And so to your point, there's these cultural differences around eating out, but there's also cultural differences around how people create food and people with big families, like they're not cooking, you know, a meal for themselves and their two kids and their husband, like they're, they're cooking a meal for themselves and their cousins and the aunt and uncles and they're going to come over later and have food. And so there's always food in the house. Yeah. And I grew up in a household like that too. And so this doesn't work for that environment because we're not creating batch meals. We're, we're really trying to solve the you don't have anything to eat for dinner tonight. You're probably going to order Uber Eats anyway. So here is something that's a little bit healthier for you that you can cook at home. And so finding that information about people. So this is, you know, like, let's say a lot of Euro like European cultures. I grew up in Europe as well. And that's how it is there. But is it fair for me to assume that anybody who's European would have that lifestyle? You know, probably not. That's, that's a completely <laughs> biased and unethical assumption. And so when it comes to uh, data engineering, um, sure, we can probably buy some data about demographics. And, and there's a company in Canada, at least called Enveronics, and they provide postal code level demographic data where we can get down to the zip code. We can see ex like generally the people that live there from the, the cultures and the backgrounds that they have and probably where they like to shop and things like that. Um, but that's not from a fe feature perspective and sort of using features and modeling like that's good, but we're still not getting to that individual person level. So now the problem becomes, okay, the people who this product is good for, we can assume they've tried our product or will at some point try it because they already care about convenience. They want a couple of meals. They don't want food waste, whatever. So the, we've already got them. But how do we reach these 
other people and how do we learn about about them how do we collect data or um, impute data in the in ways that isn't um, presumptuous and <laughs> that we're not making these sort of broad assumptions based on personal characteristics but we're actually looking at people as individuals and seeing the lifestyles that they like to lead and and that's really a tricky thing and I think I did a presentation a little while ago but one of the things I always talk about is like manual data collection versus on, like automatically generated data and I think a lot of um social media companies, for example, or internet native companies, they don't need to collect a lot of data about you. So like a Facebook, for example, you know, if you don't tell them how old you are, it doesn't matter, they'll figure out how old you are because they have enough of your engagement data. So they'll collect that about you. But we don't really have access to that. And so we do have to depend a lot on those traditional data collection methods. And, you know, in the world of data science and statistics, that used to be the truth before big data that you'd go out there and you would figure out how to sample population. You'd figure out what questions to ask. You'd go through the whole kind of survey design process. And we find ourselves having to do that so that we can collect data about people that we haven't reached yet to understand how to design our product in a way that's going to be relevant for others as well. Um, so yeah. It's a bit of a tangent and, there, but. <laughs> well, it makes sense too that you have thought about this and it's nice I'm sure that you have that ethics background and that side yeah. of things, because like you said, don't never discount your past and mm -hmm. how it can help you in the present. And uh, I, I see that shining through as you're looking at these problems and you're thinking about these different uh, challenges that you face. Now, mm -hmm. let's go into a bit more of a rapid fire session to finish it off. I want to ask, let's start it off with a, relatively simple one, the last book you read? Oh boy, um, I read a chapter from Epictetus, <laughs> Epictetus's Discourses. Uh, it was very good. It cool. was about, uh, yeah, sometimes I like to dabble into some stoic philosophy and rem mm -hmm. remind myself not to take myself too seriously and that it's all good. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, this, this particular one was about um, sort of knowing your strength. This particular chapter was a little bit about Hercules and not knowing your strength until you're put in a position to know that strength. And so the, the message was that, you know, Hercules wouldn't have known that he was Hercules until he became Hercules. And so you don't know what you can do until you kind of put yourself in that position. So why not? I guess that's wow. a nice connection back to my career development chat. <laughs> Just give it a shot. You never know where Poetic. it may lead. Yeah. <laughs> Epictetus gave me gets credit for that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, that really is. That was really nice. It gave me goosebumps and it, it reminded oh, me of something I've heard about how it's like you're never served up anything in life that you are not able to handle. So yeah. if you're going through something, you can rest assured that you are able to handle it because you're not exactly. going to be served up that thing unless you are at that particular point in your life that you can uh, go through it. And so now next one, probably a little less uh, ph <laughs> philosophic. <laughs> it's more actually, no, I'll go with this. Okay. What has been, normally we ask what the last bug that you smashed would be, but being is that you're in the managerial position, what has been one of the harder conversations you've had to have with someone and how did you navigate that? Yeah. Cool. Um, good question. Uh, actually I had to have a conversation with somebody, um, who didn't, doesn't really like writing documentation and he felt something really complex and I get it. Documentation sucks. And I honestly, I wouldn't say that this was hard. This, I love my team and I love working with everybody on my team. And, um, it's kind of like, I know people don't like to do that stuff because it's much more boring than the actual solutioning. So it was hard because I have to now make somebody do something that I know they really don't want to do. And that's not really my style. I like to let people be free. Um, but anyway, we kind of had a conversation. I, I would say that it went well because we just, this is someone that can, is very reasonable person. And once we sort of articulate the fear that if nobody else knows how the solution works, then, you know, <laughs> we're going to be kind of screwed and then somebody else is going to have to rebuild it. So he understood all good now, all fixed, but um, yeah, but it, it's hard. I think that's the hardest thing for me is sometimes like making my team do things they don't really want to do because I really try to create an environment where people are, um, you know, enjoying the work that they're doing. I find we get the best outcomes from folks when 
they enjoy the work that they're doing. So I have to try to think of like creative ways to, to encourage them and motivate them to do these less fun things, but that are pretty critical. And so if I kind of relate it back to career development and leadership capability, then that usually does the trick. Besides the part on career development and leadership capability, it, there's a lot of parallels with me and trying to get my daughter to do things she doesn't want to do, <laughs> like brush her teeth mm. at night. And I have to yeah. find fun ways to make her actually do that. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah it's a tough one. <laughs> so uh, the next one is what kind of marketing have you seen from a data product that made you roll your eyes? Oh, boy. Um, that's a good question. Honestly, I can't think of many examples right now. I think mostly because I'm not really on social media, so I just avoid a lot of the, that marketing, <laughs> that marketing that Lucky comes my you. way. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a good answer to that. I generally try to avoid avoid it. But beyond now <laughs> it's all downhill because you're joining TikTok to hear Vishnu sing. This is so. true. This is true. But that's the only <laughs> channel I'm going to follow. Is it called a channel or profile? That's the only thing I'm going to Vishnu. Yeah, we'll put it in the <laughs> description. We'll send it to Perfect. you, Vishnu's uh, channel. So Perfect. last one that I've got for you is what is a piece of technology that you are bullish on that would surprise people? Um, honestly, I think in general, in the tech space, like hardware is kind of the next big thing. I think now software is so easy to build, not easy. I shouldn't say easy to build, but easy in the sense that a lot of the tools are very accessible. So we, I, we start to see a lot of this similar type of like highly customizable S3 bucket based software integrate with anything very easily. Lots of those solutions out there. Um, I'm not seeing a whole lot of focus on a hardware and I think especially working in the food space. So hardware and packaging are the next technologies I'm really excited about packaging because there is a lot of opportunity on like keeping boxes that are traveling, especially for e-commerce, warm or cold. So two things that haven't really been solved for yet. Um, and on the uh, hardware side, um, like traceability. And when you think about like manufacturing, for example, uh, lots of great traceability solutions for sort of slow manufacturing. But if you think about automating like a distribution facility, like an Amazon or something that's highly dynamic, um, not a lot of uh, easy hardware solutions out there yet that can kind of talk to each other, that can automate what, what have you, right? Like sorting, uh, pa picking and packing, like those types of operations, especially when you have a high variability of products, uh, let's say like with food, right? Carrot, tomato, very mm -hmm. different things. Um, so how that sort of like how that hardware sort of integrates with some things like computer vision, for example, or reinforcement yeah. learning and sort of um, having machines that can learn by themselves. I know that's a very broad topic, but I think that's what I'm most excited about and lots of opportunity in that space. Oh, that's super cool. It reminds me of a conversation we had with uh, this guy, Gabriel Straub, who mm. works at Okado Technology in cool. the UK. And mm -hmm. he talked about how, like, you can envision, you know, those games that you play with the, like, claw that goes down and gets, it yeah. picks the, uh, whatever it is, stuffed animal or whatever yeah. you win. <laughs> and that is their warehouse. They have a ton of those just going around. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. use computer vision. They also are doing yeah. everything on the edge. And it's very, they're doing it in a, a probabilistic way because mm -hmm. they have to go get the apple and it's over here. And then they have to go get a carrot and it's over here. And they have to yeah. make sure the carrots are uh, actually not bruised. Well, carrots don't bruise that much, but like an yeah. avocado, you want to make sure it's not split open. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it that is a very interesting whole like world not yeah. just like a, <laughs> yeah. a topic. It is a, a whole nother world that, uh, yeah. yeah, I also love to get into that. But I think that's it. Uh, we'll end cool. it here. Um, okay. Any last words from you, Vishnu? It was a great conversation, I think, from the point of our management all the way through to talking about how data powers HelloFresh. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Great chat.